So thank you very much, first of all, <laughs> for agreeing to do this. Very gracious of you. Um, I wanted to start with a quote by uh, children's literature scholar Rudine Sims Bishop. Mm -hmm. She has argued that, quote, readers often seek their mirrors in books. She also suggests that books can serve as mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. So I wanted to know that as a child, what books offered you a reflection of yourself, and which ones opened up another world for you? Huh. It's a good question. I don't know the sliding glass door reference. I know about the mirrors and the... Um... Sliding glass door often gets left out of it. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So the window, obviously, is that you can look into someone else's mm -hmm. world, but to me, that's voyeurism. <laughs> so I love that she says you can open that sliding glass door and mm -hmm. enter the world and kind of exist as an equal with other kinds of people. Yeah. That's so important. I can't believe it's not in there. Um, I think... Um, Looking back on it, now that I'm past my kind of angry 30s of no mirrors, I feel like I was able to make the journey of kind of finding myself in any book because that was all I had. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I would read something like, Are You There, Goddess Me, Margaret, and I was flat-chested like Margaret. So, okay, so this is where we kind of met each other. Right. Um, and the books that really kind of um, open doors for me, books that kind of in retrospect made me gasp was um, Stevie by John Steptoe, just the fact that they talked like I did, they were brown like I was brown, um, they lived in the city, it looked like they lived in the apartment and the illustrations, um, and everything just kind of made me say, whoa, I know these people. Um, Mildred Taylor's Are You um, Roll Up Thunder, Hear My Cry, just because my family was from the South. And I think that's a book that I've read so many times, and each time I read it, it never gets old. I mean, I've revisited some of the books of my childhood, and some of them feel real different than they did when I was reading them as a kid. Mm -hmm. But that one has held up. Um, uh, Zeely was one of the first books I read that was by an uh, African-American about African-American people. Um, Sounder to this day still makes me angry. <laughs> and it's a, it's a room I want to walk it? out of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Did you also see the film when you were a kid? I saw the film and I actually loved the film. Yeah. Um, but the book was just... Oh, what made you me. angry about that? Um, it was... It was it, it was supposed to be my people, and it wasn't, and I, I couldn't tell how it wasn't, and so I felt like, almost kind of like I wasn't, like something almost was wrong with me, because if this is supposed to be who we are, and this is so different from who I am and who I know, um, then how, how am I legitimate? Um, and, and, you know, and as an adult, I realized... No one had a name except the dog, you know. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be Southerners. They never touched each other. And, you know, Southerners are always hugging and kissing and, like, saying, look how you've grown and mm -hmm. remarking on things you don't want them to remark on. And They were a sharecropping family, weren't they? They were sharecroppers. They were poor yeah. and sad. So, yeah. so this writer, who was not African-American, could not get inside their story. I don't know what his connection to it. He said, and I think in the foreword, he talks about someone telling him that story, like an old black man telling him the story of that family. But, but you know, the, the fact that he could create a story where he couldn't see any hope or happiness in it. And again, I didn't know this when I was a kid. I just knew that viscerally, this book made me really angry. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, later on, of course, I came to I remember If Beale Street Could Talk when I was like in the seventh grade, maybe, and just, you know, Tish and Lonnie and that they lived in um, um, Harlem or wherever they lived. They lived somewhere in the city, and that right. it was such a kind of loving love story. And um, then later on, The Bluest Eye. I remember reading The Bluest Eye when I was and a I kid. I would like to go back to something you said also in that answer, which was that you had an angry period in your 30s. <laughs> and I don't detect rage in your writing. I actually see a lot of grace oh. um, in your writing. And I wondered where that rage came from and where it went. Uh, um, it's a really good question. I think the rage was more in my life. I think, uh, you know, it wasn't until my 30s that I really 
early 30s that I really started thinking about the disparity um, between race and, and economic class and all of those ways in which the world just wasn't working. Um, I think that's when I started coming more into a sense of myself as kind of an outsider. And I mean, as a kid, I felt it all the time because I was a Jehovah's Witness and, you know, my family was kind of different from other families on the block. But I think in terms of my growing consciousness of who I was and kind of how I fit into the greater scheme of things, it, it was kind of shocking to realize that, no, I wasn't part of this kind of um, um, privileged majority that had an education before college and that um, really had a lot of privilege and, by, and with the privilege entitlement. And, and I kind of had to learn about my right to be here. And, and that, that was through a lot of anger and then acceptance, not of that world as it was, but of the fact that, yeah, I do have a right to be here and I do have something to say and I'm as smart as and sometimes smarter than people who've been um, well-educated or were able to pay for a lot of education. So it was definitely um, a time of growing and growing through that anger and I think what the writing was and the way the kind of grace came through in the writing was, it was catharsis for me. And I think there were probably drafts that were angrier than other drafts that I, I kind of realized I'm not gonna be heard through the rage, I'll be heard through the love. Um, and it's kind of what began to inform all of my life, and including my writing, does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> Something I could probably learn from <laughs> as I'm still in my angry 30s. <laughs> okay, um, my next question is that you are the parent of two children. In 2011, how easy is it for your children to find their mirrors in books? And I wondered if motherhood has changed the way you write. I know you took your daughter to a, a literary festival not long ago, which I think is great. I'd love to know how that went. Oh, goodness. It was, um, I, I think um, one thing motherhood has done is it's given me even more of a sense of urgency in terms of what's at stake, what's at stake for how my children will see themselves in the world. I think um, before I was a parent, I thought about it in terms of the child and children, but I didn't have a real personal connection to it except the connection that was me as a child and wanting what I didn't have as a child in the literature that I created um, and wanting that for other children. And then once I start, I had my children and seeing that they needed something to um, really thinking more deeply and more urgently about it. Not like, you know, my daughter does not read my book, so she says I'm not a fan, and maybe one day she will. <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah, she says she likes funny stuff, so, <laughs> and I'm not funny. But um, okay. my son reads them, or has them. He will let us read the picture books to him. And he says, you know, I wrote that book. I wrote, we were at Putnam yesterday, and he kept saying to Nancy, because they have posters of all the Newberries and right. the Caldecotts and the Coretta Scott Kings, and he, every time he came across one of my books, he's like, I wrote that with Mommy. <laughs> you weren't even <laughs> He's claiming his role yeah. as you. That's great. He also said he wrote Make Way for Ducklings, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it was hysterical. <laughs> claiming ownership. But it, it definitely brought that sense of urgency to me, um, and... Um, I think I got funnier because I think my kids make me laugh so much. Um, I think I started thinking more about, I never had that um, censor flag that I think some young writers have of, you know, this is going to embarrass my family or this is going to make my parents mad at me. But I think now with children, I do think when Toshi reads this, if she reads it in 10 years, how is it going to make her feel? Or right. what is she going to think about me and where I was in this place? And it definitely informs how I'm writing stuff. Um, 